She holds an MBA from Stanford University. Ms. Ko, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Tom. Distinguished guests and colleagues, it is really my honor to welcome you to the Knowledge Symposium on Integrated River Basin Management, Lessons from the People's Republic of China and the Asian Pacific Region. This symposium is an outcome of our long-standing and successful partnership with the People's Republic of China. Throughout three decades of collaborative journey, the ADB and China have sought to balance economic progress with environmental sustainability. ADB's country partnership strategy for China covering 2021 to 2025 supports government's efforts to achieve high quality green development in line with the 14th five-year plan. This partnership has been supported by combining ADB's project financing with technical assistance and knowledge work. ADB's policy support has also been critical to assist China design projects and programs that pursue a holistic approach to transform the rural economy, promote low carbon development, and address social inequality. ADB's preparation for the Yangtze River Economic Belt Development Plan has been pivotal to achieve these goals. The adoption of a green ecological corridor approach was a key innovation to coordinate public investments to strengthen environmental management, ecological protection, and inclusive economic growth in the Yangtze River Economic Belt. With investments of about $2.89 billion on green development projects in the Yangtze River Economic Belt since 2015, ADB has packaged lending and non-lending assistance using a programmatic approach across core areas of support in close consultation with the government. Institutional strengthening and policy reforms have been essential to help drive enhanced coordination, especially among provincial and local governments. The Yangtze River Economic Belt has focused on protection, management and restoration of nature and ecosystems using green infrastructure and nature-based solutions to mitigate water-related disaster risks and pollution. ADB's project interventions in the Yangtze River Economic Belt have prioritized green development, low carbon transformation, watershed protection, and sustainable agriculture to promote rural urban integration and develop more livable cities. Taking this partnership forward, ADB's support to China will prioritize new financial instruments and policies to scale up private sector engagement. Green financing mechanisms will increase the role of regional banks to promote commercial finance, commercial loans, and offer innovative and inclusive finance products and services. Shaped by ADB's experience in the Yangtze River, ADB has initiated a new basin-wide initiative called the Yellow River Ecological Corridor, or YREC, which promotes a multi-sector an integrated approach for lending and non-lending operations, including technical assistance, policy dialogue, and knowledge sharing. Addressing climate change mitigation and adaptation also remains a key priority for both the YREB, the Yangtze River Economic Belt, and the YREC, which is the Yellow River Ecological Corridor. Knowledge sharing is central to ADB's operations under the new country partnership strategy with China. Our partnership has provided an opportunity for ADB to learn and showcase lessons from its investments and policy interventions pioneered in China. Many of China's cutting edge initiatives on environment and development provide important lessons and replicable practices, not just for ADB member countries, but also for the global community. Capturing and sharing this knowledge continues to increase understanding of green development and highlights innovations in project design, technology, and institutional reforms. Today's knowledge sharing event is an important step towards leveraging knowledge partnerships for green development and sustainable basin management. I'm very pleased to welcome colleagues from government agencies, including the Ministry of Ecology and Environment, as well as the Yellow River Basin Conservancy Commission. Their roles have been central to shape ongoing institutional and policy reforms 
and will be critical to help drive the program in the Yellow River Ecological Corridor to achieve high quality green development. I'm also delighted to welcome our partners from academia, civil society and the private sector, along with our colleagues from other ADB regional departments to share experiences across Asia and the Pacific. We can all draw lessons from the challenges they face and the solutions they develop to address them. This symposium is a great opportunity to first, learn from each other, second, strengthen existing partnerships, and third, initiate new collaboration around integrated river basin management. Let me express my sincere gratitude to all panelists and participants from across the globe for contributing to this event. Let me also thank the PRC Fund for its generous support to make this event possible. Thank you once again, and please enjoy your discussions today. Over to you, Tom. Thank you very much, uh, DG Co. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Zhu Feng Sun, who is the Associate Counsel of the Department of International Cooperation at the Ministry of Ecology and Environment in the PRC. He holds a PhD in plant ecology. Previously, he uh, had worked in the Department of Nature and Ecology Conservation and MAE for more than a decade in the Foreign Environmental Cooperation Center, responsible for the management of nature reserves, international cooperation on biodiversity conservation, as well as implementation of biodiversity conventions. He's worked in MEE since 2010 and has been responsible for cooperation between the PRC and many Asian countries, along with cooperation with the Asian Development Bank. Uh, Mr. Sun, uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank 专家就留意中和管理者课题呢双方就总结纪元项目经验它不仅涉及流域不同的行政区域利益相关方近年来中国政府相继将长江经济带发展规划纲要推动长江与黄河保护立法
，所有这些实践所产生的积极成效呢，正在逐步显现。长江黄河流域的生态环境质量得到了比较好的改善，但同时，我们也应该看到，长江黄河流域还面临着污染防治任务艰巨、生态修复难度大、环境治理投入不足等挑战。呃，就像刚才这个呃，徐礼峰林局长所说的，近几年来呢，我们与亚航合作，在流域管理领域实施了《长江保护法》政策建议、《黄河流域生态保护立法》规划机制研究等项目，为长江黄河的生态保护提供了重要的技术支撑。今天的会议呢，主要针对流域管理的关键要素，设计了很好的议题，包括流域发展的顶层设计、流域管理创新政策。绿色发展融资等，既有中国经验，也有其他国家，包括东南亚、中亚、南亚等的这个呃流域管理的经验分享。从参会的人员看呢，我看呢有政府机构、有国际组织代表，还有专家学者啊，还有私营企业、非政府组织的嗯、啊、的代表，具有较好的代表性和广泛性。希望通过今天的会议的交流的话呢，可以进一步探讨流域管理的最佳解决方案，造福于。呃，亚洲人民，造福于呃其他国家的人民。嗯，最后。Thank you very much,、uh, Dr. Sun, for your opening remarks. And with that, let's move to the first session.、Um, I'd like to hand the moderation over to my colleague Sean. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Tom, and、uh, without further ado, let's move into session one. Session one is entitled "One Ecological Unit from Managing the Yellow River from Source to Sea," and I'd like to now hand the floor and introduce uh, again uh, Tom Panella, who will, who's the director of the uh, East Asia uh, Environment, Natural Resources, and Agriculture Division, and he will be presenting on ADB's Yellow River Ecological Corridor Program,、um, an integrated approach. Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sean.、Um, yeah, as noted, I'll be speaking on ADB's Yellow River Ecological Corridor Program, an integrated approach. Next slide, please. Let's have an overview of the basin、um, to get a flavor of what we're dealing with. First, it's the second longest river in the PRC, covering. Uh, seven provinces and two autonomous regions. It is a key basin for agriculture, mining, and energy production. Yet it's a very water scarce basin, with、uh, inhabitants having、uh, less than 500 cubic meters、uh, per capita, about 23 percent of the national average. And in fact, it only has two percent of the PRC's water resources. Yet it supplies 12 percent of the population. Uh, irrigates 15% of the arable land and is responsible for 14% of other economic activities of the PRC. So very important and productive.、Um, flooding is a major issue throughout the basin, both with、um, small annual、uh, occurrences, but also、uh, with mega floods,、uh, resulting in significant damage and loss of life. It、uh, has severe erosion. Problems. In fact, it's the most,、uh, it's the highest sediment concentration in the world. Hence, where it gets its name, the Yellow River, and unequal water distribution and regional inequalities. Next slide, please. So, to address this,、um, we've taken、uh, ecological corridor、uh, as the basis of the YREC, and the ecological corridor is defined as a geographic space. That is governed and managed over the long term to maintain or restore effective ecological connectivity and ecosystem integrity.、Uh, accordingly, river basins are naturally、uh, such corridors if they're well managed,、um, and healthy ecological corridors generate positive impacts for the environment,、uh, for economic growth, social well-being, and can address the climate change goals of the PRC. Um, and some of the things we want to do is maintain biodiversity, ensure watershed,、uh, river and wetland uh, health uh, to mitigate disasters,、uh, provide ecosystem services, and provide a health and a healthy and safe environment. Next slide, please. 
Um, the program uses an integrated approach to natural resources management and environmental and ecological conservation and climate change um, as combined with this to support high quality green development. And uh, importantly, this is achieved through institutional and policy reforms, knowledge and innovation, and promoting private sector. Um, the goal is to restore the Yellow, Bas the Yellow River Basin's diverse and fragile aquatic terrestrial and ecological uh, ecosystems um, to enable more equitable and sustainable development. Um, and we have a strategic programmatic approach to maximize catalytic uh, and systemic impacts. Next slide, please. Uh, the program is fully aligned with the new country partnership strategy that was approved about a year ago with the PRC, the first pillar being environmentally sustainable development, uh, the second being climate change adaptation and mitigation, and also emphasizing private sector and finance solutions. Next slide, please. Uh, climate change is very important to the program, uh, as well as our overall PRC program. Uh, the government has expressed its uh, ambitions for climate new, uh, for carbon neutrality by 2060, and the 14th five-year plan has uh, several targets uh, related to climate, including reducing carbon, energy uh, usage intensity, increasing forest coverage, and increasing the mix of renewables for generation. Uh, importantly, ADB is also supporting the Ministry of uh, Ecology and Environment to develop the uh, National Climate Change Adaptation Strategy um, to strengthen economic and social resilience to climate change, promote use of nature-based solutions. And importantly, um, once the strategy is finished, ADB interventions can help implement and mainstream the strategy. Next, please. Also, rural vitalization uh, is an important um, foundation to the program, and uh, ADB is supporting the government's uh, program on rural vitalization, uh, starting with production systems, the value chain, uh, the rural, develop rural environment, and also um, looking at a more integrated rural development approach. Supporting this, uh, ADB has two MOUs, the first with the Agriculture Development Bank of China uh, for co-financing, but also for shared knowledge uh, and uh, working together on capacity building. And we have an MOU with the NDRC and uh, Ministry of Finance to support uh, the government's rural vitalization strategy. Next, please. Um, for the programmatic approach, we have three principles. First is institutional strengthening, which underpins everything we do with the PRC program uh, for improved governance and in institutions, uh, policy reforms, and cooperation frameworks in enabling environments. Uh, we're promoting innovative approaches uh, from technology to uh, private sector solutions. Um, innovative finance and also doing gender mainstreaming in all of our projects. And knowledge management like this symposium is key also to our interventions. Uh, we have high quality knowledge generation and dissemination, um, are looking to enhance our regional cooperation. And uh, we can do this through multi-stakeholder platforms and strategic partnerships. Next slide, please. Um, this programmatic approach uh, first came to be through the um, Yangtze River Economic Belt Initiative, um, which is still ongoing and our uh, Director General mentioned. Um, it uh, has a uh, development plan for institutional coordination um, and is again a programmatic approach with lending and non-lending assistance and knowledge work and uh, includes development of planning tools um, and integrated approaches. However, one thing we, we would like to focus more on in the Yellow River program is uh, on upstream work for policy and institutional reforms and investment planning and to enhance the knowledge base. Towards this end, uh, we have a cluster TA uh, with 13 sub-projects ongoing, uh, generating knowledge uh, about different aspects of the basin. Next slide, please. Um, lastly, let's I just want to mention the thematic areas where we, we will be engaging in the Yellow River Ecological Corridor Program. 
This is in water and natural resources management, ecosystem and biodiversity conservation, and nature-based solutions. Resilient climate smart agriculture and value chains, climate change mitigation and adaptation. Next slide, please. Integrated rural, urban rural green development and circular economy and application of high tech high level technology. And again, this focus on private sector and innovative financing. Um, lastly, I just like to say this is a, a new initiative and it's still evolving. And we hope to be back uh, to you with results periodically as we move along with our PRC and partnership. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. That was a really good uh, overview of our Yellow River program. Um, I'd like to now introduce uh, the next speaker in this session. Her name is uh, Sun Feng. Uh, Ms. Sun is the Deputy Director General of the Department of International Cooperation, Science and Technology of the Yellow River Conservancy Commission of the Ministry of Water Resources in China. She's got an extensive amount of experience in, in this space. I've worked with her for, for many years and uh, she will now provide an overview of the uh, Yellow River Basin Ecological Protection and High Quality Development Action Plan. Uh, so, uh, Madam Sun, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chair Ao Jing Yi, for your introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, first, I would like to thank ADB Symposium organizer to give me this opportunity to speak online and meet old friends and new friends here. I hope we can meet face by face in the near future. Uh, just now, Mr. Thomas um, Panilla has introduced ADB Yellow River Ecological Corridor Program. Actually, YRCC has been working together with ADB for more than 20 years, has established a very good relationship with each other. And the YRCC would like to keep and continue this cooperation with ADB and uh, the other organizations and then learn from each other and share with each other. Uh, my today's topic is the Yellow River Basin Ecological Protection and the High Quality Development with the Security Action Plan. Next slide, please. A Yellow River uh, is located in the northern part of China, originate from the Tibet Plateau, descends 4,500 meters, meanders for 5,500 5, 5, kilometers before empty into Pacific Ocean, which is the catchment area, 790,000 square kilometers, leaving 400 million people. Every year, 1.6 billion tons sediment flowing into the Yellow River Channel, which ranks number one in the world's large rivers. The river is the major source for the northern part of China for hydropower, irrigation, and the drinking water. Next slide, please. Uh, we see Yellow River, the mother river of China, which has played an important role in Chinese history. That means in Chinese 5,000 years history, Yellow River Basin has been the political, economic, and the cultural center of China for more than 3,000 years. So it has many significant importance to China. First, it's an important economic zone uh, because time limitation, I don't want to mention in detail, Second, it is an important ecological corridor. Third, it is the cradle of Chinese civilization and culture. In addition, it is also important area for poverty reduction. Next slide, please. On September 18th, 2019, China General Secretary Xi Jinping chair and address in a symposium in Yellow River Basin. After that, Yellow River Basin, ecological protection and the high quality development has risen to a major national strategy in line with the other four national strategies. Like just uh, you mentioned the Yangtze River, economic, economic belt and et cetera. Chinese government set the vision of comprehensively improve water security capability that the Yellow River become the happy river for the benefit of the people as the goal for the next phase from 2020 to 2035. And the YRCC is responsible to develop 
Water Security Action Plan in the Yellow River Basin, which is a major initiative to improve multi-level and multi-dimensional efforts for integrated river basin management and the high quality development. Next slide, please. In order to achieve this goal, four capabilities must be greatly strengthened and then improved. First, ecological water security. In order to improve ecological water security, concrete measures must be taken in the upper reach, focus on improve water source conservation. In the middle reach, the main task are watershed rehabilitation to promote nature recovery pollution control in tributaries, and then in downstream to strengthen the wetland protection. In addition, to enhance the function of the river ecological corridors. Second, flood management security. Facing water-related disaster security, such as flood and drought in the Yellow River Basin, the main measures must be taken to further improve and complete water sediment regulation system, meanwhile to enhance the flood control engineering system, the most important to improve accuracy of flood forecasting, early warning, rehearsal, and the pre-scheme, and the improve flood emergency response capability to ensure long-term stability of the Yellow River. Third, integrated water resources management. Facing water shortage and imbalance, the following measures must be taken to give up priority to water conservation first and take the water resources as the most rigid constraint for the Yellow River development. Meanwhile, to optimize water resources allocation scheme and the building a water saving society through National Water Saving Action Plan and further improve ability of the urban and the rural water supply security. Fourth, strengthen the basin governance capability to reach high quality development. In order to improve the basin governance capability, legal system should be further strengthened. Yellow River Protection Law will be issued soon. In order to enhance coordinated mechanism, river and lake chief working mechanism has been established. Meanwhile, river basin authority will play more important role and the smart yellow river construction is undertaking to strengthen scientific and technical support to promote yellow river basin high quality development. In conclude, Yellow River Basin Water Security Action Plan gave a priority to water saving, emphasize balanced special allocation, systematic governance, focus on ecological protection, green and sustainable development to ensure comprehensive water security capability and carry forward water governance reform and innovation in the Yellow River Basin. That's all, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Madam Sun. So now, now that we've had a taste of uh, the future program in terms of the Yellow River Ecological Corridor, let me now bring us to session two. Session two will be looking at policies and enabling environments. And we have three speakers in this session. And these speakers will give us a bit of a snapshot of some work that is uh, that has been done, as well as work that uh, will be done in this space uh, to look at the policy and the, the legislative frameworks that, that are required for, for really getting the river basin management um, equation right. The first speaker is Boya Jiang. Boya is the nature and climate lawyer at Client Earth, an environmental law charity focusing on advancing environmental governance and rule of law. She's a legal expert. She's got a, a degree from, the, from law from the University of Oxford. Uh, she was central to some of the work supporting our Yangtze River Protection Law uh, support work uh, with the government. And uh, she's now focusing on how to promote the environmental rule of law to help resolve issues relating to biodiversity and climate change. Uh, so Boya, uh, the, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.
呃，谢谢各位好啊！首先非常感谢亚洲开发银行的邀请，今天主要想和大家分享一下这个视力保护法将如何推动气候诉讼和流域治理。呃，下一页，谢谢。Next slide, please. 呃，二零二一年的十二月份呢，中国出台了首部的视力保护法。这部法律将于今年的六月一号正式实施。目前，中国的这个视力总面积大约是五千三百六十万平方公顷，占世界视力总面积的百分之十。所以，保护好中国的视力资源，对于全世界来说都是意义重大的事情。而值得一提的是呢，视力保护法它不光是视力保护自己的一个重要的法律保障，更将。对气候变化诉讼和流域治理有重要的作用。首先跟大家简要的说一下视力保护法中那些亮点。呃，与其他的法律相比，我们能够看到视力保护法大大的加强了公众参与和信息公开。从数量上来看呢，这个法律的条文总共是六十五条，但是其中有九条都是和公众参与、呃公众参与、信息公开制度相关的。呃，法律要求各级人民政府和有关部门要积极依法公开视力保护的相关信息，并接受社会的监督。这个也为中呃公众参与视力保护和流域治理提供了一个重要的法律保障。此外呢，就是视力保护法极大的提高了这个处罚力度，大大的提高了违法的成本。呃，非法占用视力的罚款最高可达每平方米一万元。呃，大家可能不太了解，就是此前中国各省出台的一些法律法规当中，呃，罚款最低的可能只有这个每平方米两元钱。所以这么来对比的话，视力保护法的处罚力度是有很大的提升的。然后此外，呃，想跟大家特别分享的就是视力保护法通过对红树林和泥炭沼泽的这个特别保护，来助力应对气候变化的问题。大家都知道，红树林实际具有非常重要的这个生态功能，能够有效的保护沿海海岸带，维持海岸生物多样性啊，还有可以缓解这个温室效应。而泥炭沼泽湿地呢，它也是具备所有生态系统中最强大的碳储存能力。呃，据我们的这个分析和了解呢，为了进一步强调湿地对于应对气候变化的重要作用，所以新出台的这个湿地保护法，它对红树林湿地和泥炭沼泽湿地都进行了专项的规定，呃，进行特别保护，希望能够通过这种方式加强中国对气候变化的这种应对和处理。呃，下一页，谢谢。呃，首先跟大家呃聊一下这个视力保护法和整个气候变化诉讼的关系。呃，第一个呢，就是先简要的提一下中国的检察公益诉讼制度。其实，呃，检察公益诉讼制度作为中国的一个非常呃具有中国特色的司法制度，它具有着非常重要的作用。呃，从二零一六年以来，我们克莱恩斯欧洲环保协会呢一直都和中国的最高人民检察院保持着非常紧密的合作关系。所以，我们也是见证了整个中国检察公益诉讼，尤其是环境公益诉讼的这样蓬勃发展的一个过程。呃，从二零二一年一年，检察这个检察机关在办理生态环境公益诉讼案件就超过了八点八万件，可见它对于整个生态环境领域，对于这个湿地保护也好、长江保护也好、黄河保护也好，都会有着巨大的作用和潜力。呃，这个视力保护法中呢，它也规定说，对于造成生态损害的责任人，国家规定的机关和法律规定的组织，可以请求行为人承担责任、赔偿损失和相关的费用。呃，所以视力保护法这个相关的规定是和中国之前环境保护法的规定，呃，有异曲同工的这个作用的，它合并是非常契合。呃，可以通过这种检察公益诉讼的方式，为中国的这个视力保护做出呃巨大的贡献。同时呢，它也是。呃，中国气候诉讼将来发展的一个非常重要的途径。然后我们之前也提到说，湿地保护法针对红树林湿地和泥炭沼泽湿地，呃，进行了一些专项的规定和特别的保护，希望能够通过这种方式来推动中国的气候变化诉讼的发展。所以说，结合这个检察机关公益诉讼制度，加上湿地保护法的这种从制度上的支持，我们认为，呃，这个方式将是中国未来气候诉讼呃探索的一个非常重要的途径。另外呢，就是，呃，二零二一年的十二月，最高人民法院也发布了一个关于生态环境侵权案件适用禁止令保全措施的若干规定，就是这关于禁止令的司法解释
呃继续订正司法解释，就是说法院可以在假设如果有一个项目，它可能对生态环境造成不可逆转或者是难以弥补的损害，那么法院就可以下令暂时终止该项目，以避免该项目在案件审理过程中持续的对生态环境产生影响。呃，我们认为这个禁止令的司法解释在势力保护和气候变化这一块都会有非常重要的潜力，所以说结合着这个检察公诉讼制度、新的势力保护法和新的禁止令司法解释，中国的气候诉讼可能会迎来一个呃比较好的发展的时机，应该未来会看到更多的相关的案件。下一页，谢谢。呃，最后呢，还想跟大家分享一下势力保护和流域治理的问题。去年，我们克莱斯州环保协会也非常呃荣幸能够有机会和亚洲开发银行共同进行了一个关于长江保护法的研究。所以，长江保护法和势力保护法一样，都是我们非常关注的一个重点的领域。其实，从目前颁布的法律情况来看，势力保护法里边已经有了明确的条款，呃，对这个在有一些领域是要适用长江保护法相关的法律要求的。而长江保护法呢，此前也因为它出台的较早嘛，所以它应该不会有跟湿地保护法交叉适用的条款。但是长江保护法里边对湿地保护进行了非常多的相关条款的规定，比如说它要求国家呃国务院的林业和草原主管部门或者政府部门，它应该维护湿地的生态功能啊、生物多样性啊、加强对湿地的保护啊。所以呢，很明显的看到两个法律中的一个交叉适用的关系。呃，我们相信，在湿地保护法和长江保护法都已经颁布的情况下，中国的流域治理将会达到一个新的高度。最后呢，就是呃，都知道这个目前黄河保护法正在加紧的制定过程中，我们也希望能够在黄河保护法中能够看到更多的和中国呃气候变化诉讼相关的内容和流域治理相关的内容，然后希望能够看到呃未来更好的发展。我的分享就是这样，谢谢大家。Thanks very much, Boya.、Uh, the legislative aspect is, is certainly very important as part of this broader river basin、uh, planning and framework. So I will now bring in to introduce the next speaker.、Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Zhu Yonghui. He's a professor of hydraulic engineering and director of international cooperation department at、uh, the Changjiang River Scientific Research Institute. Now they're part of the Yangtze River Partnership, which is a、uh, partner organization under the Global Water Partnership, and Dr. Zhu has been responsible for a number of projects in this space. And、uh, today, he'll be introducing an innovative policy approach in addressing pollution from source to sea.、Uh, Dr. Zhu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you.、Um, good afternoon and good morning. Uh, my name is Yonghui Zhu. I come from the Changjiang River Scientific Research Institute in the GWB China Yangtze River Basin.、Uh, Changjiang and Yangtze are actually different names for the same river. And the topic I'd like to share with you today is innovative policy approach in addressing pollution control over the Yangtze from source to sea, the basin enhanced river chief system.、Uh, next slide, please. Uh, first, uh, please allow me to briefly introduce the River Chief System. The River Chief System is China's innovation to implement local government entity responsibility for protection and the management of rivers by appointing government's principal leader as the River Chief. The River Chiefs act as coordinators of、uh, different departments, for example, water resources to agriculture. Transportation, ecology, and the environment to promote integrated management of the river between multi-multi departments. The main tasks of the river chiefs include water resources protection, river shoreline management, water pollution prevention, water environmental governance, water ecology restoration, and law enforcement and supervision. Next slide, please. Next, please. Next slide, please. Yes. Okay. No, 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 no. The one before. Last one. 
No, you have to go back one slide, please. Yes, okay. So the impl implementation of the river chief system has further strengthened the management responsibility of local governments. However, still facing some challenges in the basin level integrated management. For example, fragmented management with thousands of river chiefs at the different levels involved and the interest conflicts sometimes well, between a neighboring river reaches are possible. And there also could be some inconsistent standards in terms of, for example, the water quality, the evaluation index between different river reaches or different administrative regions. So the solution is to introduce source to sea approach to promote the integrated management of the whole basin. Next, please. Next slide, please. Yes. The river chief system and the, the source to sea approach have good complementarity. After integrating source to sea approach into the river chief system, the river chief system, we have the characteristics of holistic, collaborative, participatory, result oriented, and adaptive at the same time, thus promoting the integrated basin management. Next slide, please. So in addition, uh, in addition to government uh, departments, uh, enterprises, social groups, and the private sectors also need to play an important role in the pollution control. Last year, under the sponsorship of GWP, we worked together with the Nanjing Institute of Environmental Science and the Tanjiang Technology and Economy Society on the initiative called the Building Multi-Stakeholder Partnerships for Plastic Pollution Control and the Monitoring in the Yangtze River. The objective of the initiative is to use multi-stakeholder approach to enhance the collaboration between river chief offices, the private sectors, state-owned enterprises and other actors to strengthen the capacities of river chief system in regard to plastic pollution monitoring and the control in the Yangtze River Basin. Well, plastic is just one of the pollutants that threaten the river. We would like to extend the experience and the policy suggestions gained from the multi-stakeholder partnerships initiative to further improve the river management Next slide, please. In order to further improve the river chief system by adapting the concept of source to sea approach, so as to achieve better river basin management, uh, integrated management, the basin enhanced river chief system is proposed, which is uh, be rich in short. That is to say that uh, under the improved system, basin level, a basin river chief will be assigned and they are still allowed to do to improve the beverage and we hope that one day it can be put into practice and the next slide please well that's all that's all for my sharing and thank you very much for your attention thank you thank you very much dr Zhu. that's a very insightful presentation on the the work that uh, you're your department is doing and, and it shows that there's a lot of interaction and connection with the, in the, in, with the institutional arrangements, including the legal and, and other things uh, that are required to support basin wide management. Uh, so we'll quickly now move to the third speakers in this session. Uh, and the third speakers uh, are Jan Bax and uh, Bo Yang. Now, now Jan is a senior strategic advisor to the DG of uh, Netherlands PBL. Uh, he specializes in assessing and processing environmental information uh, for, deci for decision making. Uh, he's got a background with the OECD and World Bank, um, also UNEP, and uh, he's been also assisting the China Council for International Collaboration on Environment and Development, also known as CCICD, and is currently coordinating a new uh, policy study uh, on the integrated management of river basins in the times of climate change. Uh, Bo Yang is a freshwater program director for the Nature Conservancy China program, 
She has 15 years of conservation planning and management experience for the TNC in China. And uh, she began her career conserving wetlands and working to restore the, the Yangtze River before working now on this area of urban resiliency. So Jan and, uh, and Bo, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Jan Bakkers. Um, and I want to tell you about a study, a long-term study of the China Council that has just started. I guess everybody's familiar with the CCICD, um, half international, half Chinese, senior levels, and reporting to, to the Chinese vice premier. Um, the main mechanism of the China Council is uh, studies, special policy studies, and this is a new one. Um, Yang Bo and I will present together. And next slide, please. Um, this study about integrated management of river basins in times of climate change has just started, and it, um, its core will be looking in depth at promising cases of integrated management of river basins. Um, we believe that uh, especially climate change adaptation needs and the need for decarbonization complicates and exacerbates many of the existing challenges. So dealing with them one by one is not going to work anymore if it ever worked. The scope of the study is worldwide, but with extra detail within China, not only geographically in terms of river basins, but also special attention for themes in management of river basins that are especially important for China, like sediment flows, fast urbanization, nutrient loads, and also the long-term menace of drought from glacier-fed basins. And we also, importantly, will look at everything within the basin, including cities, including land use, including the energy industry. Um, as common with these uh, special policy studies for the China Council, they lead by Chinese and international organizations. And it, this occasion, it is three. Um, on the Chinese side, it is the China Academy of Urban Planning and Design. And that shows you the importance we uh, attach to land use, urbanization, and spatial organization. It is the Nature Conservancy, and it's PBL in the Netherlands. Um, we focus on five high-level principles, and I have no time to explain them here, but they're all in a good scoping study that we did. And as I said, spatial organization within drainage and basins will surely come out uh, for in scrutiny um, and comparing case studies. Also the timing of interventions in the spirit of set a hundred year perspective and reason back. And then also the use of foresight, actually how to do that. These um, special policy studies are usually mandated in the context of a five year a program of work of the China Council. For a special reason, we have been asked to start already this year before the, the next um, five year cycle. And I, I'll come to that later. Next slide. Yes, please. And just to underline the global scope with extra detail in China, here's the map of the drainage basins that we uh, considered for the, uh, the scoping study. Next slide, please. And then over to Bo. Sorry for the mute. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, thanks, thanks yeah. yeah. Uh, as, 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 as Yang mentioned, this is the uh, worldwide uh, scope and with extra detail, extra detail within China. China. And uh, uh, this, uh, this study work actually is based on a continuous uh, scoping uh, study. That study summarized 14 types of predators driven by human activities and climate change in river basin areas. 
uh, it highlights the reality of climate change that is seriously changing the whole area for policy, governance, and research on river basin management. So, uh, with this uh, study report, considering of the short time uh, in the first phase, that is uh, this June, uh, the study will focus on the Yangtze River Basin in China, and uh, an investigative framework will be built on earlier work as the previous SPS on, on the Yangtze and uh, a, a quick scan, scan of the young and the rain uh, uh, ran rework at a uh, hundred year, year scale. scale. Uh, uh, meanwhile, some, some typical cases of other international rivers, especially topics on uh, decarbonization, urban infrastructure, biodiversity conservation, nature-based solutions, and adaptation to climate change will be optimized. Uh, uh, next slide, slide please. Uh, so, so the, the framework, framework will be built by comparing cases and drawing lessons from practice around the world. Uh, focus will be put on current and future river basin development, uh, river basin resilience and adaptability, river basin management and governance. Uh, special, special attention, attention will be given, given to the climate change, change that, that is the uh, uh, changing game section, uh, which, which will, will sketch how climate change, change impacts the river basin and the need for decarbonization, both interact with existing challenges and opportunities. Uh, it, it highlights, highlights the urgency, urgency context, context and the uncertainties, especially the significant changing uh, changes in the use of land and water resources within the basin and the adapted river basin ecosystem service that will change accordingly. Uh, uh, we, we are, are currently, currently on schedule. schedule. Uh, we, we will invite uh, review comments on our draft report, report later and, and welcome, welcome case, case recommendations. recommendations. So, so Yang, please take over from here. here. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Bo. Um, a minute ago, I mentioned that there was a special reason why this special policy study was asked to start already this year. And that reason is that um, not only has the world seen a um, conference of parties for climate, most recently in Glasgow, and the Kuming COP on biodiversity, but there's a, there's a third one coming up, and that will be in March 2023. That is the second ever UN water conference. The previous one was 46 years ago, so that it doesn't happen every year. And we were asked to make to put forward suggestions for creative input by China into that water conference, in particular um, to help strengthen um, what is probably going to be an outcome of that conference, namely a water pact in energy to the climate pact after Glasgow. And so we're currently working on that, and it will require some recommendations. So that's our third deliverable, especially for this half year. And then in addition um, to those deliverables, we will also uh, put forward the immediately obvious policy recommendations that we find already from, from this preparatory work. And we will put forward suggestions for at least two events in the second half of the year, one probably in association with the water conference and the other probably looking in depth um, at the comparisons over a hundred year time scale between the Yangtze Basin, the Rhine Basin, and most probably the Mississippi as well. Next slide, please. Um, and in all modesty, I must say that um, we have big gaps in our knowledge, of course. Um, the first is obvious that we started from Northern Hemisphere uh, knowledge, in particular, uh, Northwestern Europe, China, somewhat from the US. And that regional balance uh, needs to be improved as we go along and as we um, organize field trips to compare cases. S a second important one is the relation between decarbonization and river basins, just because it's new. And as Bo already mentioned, we really looking forward to cases and stories. We, we know a couple. This uh, um, conference is very important and it will be more like that. Um, so we are constantly hunting for more interesting and inspiring case studies. Next slide, please. And here's our contact information. Thank you very much. 
Thanks, thanks, Yan, and thanks, uh, Yangbo, for that presentation. Uh, I'll, I'll now uh, like to introduce the moderator to the next session, uh, Sylvia Kadasha, who's uh, with ADB's East Asia Department, will now uh, moderate session three. Sylvia, over to you. Um, thank you, Sean, and uh, thanks to our panelists um, from previous session who worked, who worked us through very interesting perspectives and also uh, key milestones in terms of uh, uh, policy governance mechanisms, uh, as well as planning tools. Um, I would like to now take you to session three, uh, which is about advanced tools and methodologies to value nature and green financing mechanisms, such as private insurance for disaster risk management. Um, we have two speakers with us, and our first speaker is um, uh, Ms. Yu Fang. Uh, she's the director um, of the Center for Environmental and Economic Accounting at the Chinese Academy of Environmental Planning. Uh, Professor Fang has dedicated long-term work in environmental and economic accounting, environmental risk, and damage assessment. Today, uh, she'll be presenting on metro capital accounting and its application in the Yangtze and the Yellow River basins. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Fang, and the floor is yours. Uh, 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 yes. Ni uh, we can hear you well. Okay. Okay. Uh, 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 Namawatin uh, 时间关系我不想不介绍整个国际上的进展那我只说一下我们国内那么国内呢目前已有那个我们生态环境部环境规划院正在推动的这个价值核算呢是从零四年开始那么我们先做这个绿色基地的核算那么当时呢我们主要是
那么它，我们根据我们的核算呢，是从二零一五年的七十点六万亿，增长到了这个二零二零年的八十二点一万亿。那么其中呢，产品供给从十三点三万亿增长到十四点五万亿，提高了百分之十一。那么调节服务呢，是呃在这个呃三部分里面的占比最高的，是从四十九点七万亿元增长到了五十九点三万亿元，增长了百分之十九。那么同时呢，文化旅游呢，增长也是呃比较快的。嗯，但是呢，受这个疫情的影响，那么实际上这个如果用我们用的是二零二零年的这个数据，呃，那么它是二零一五年的七点一万，呃，七点七万亿的一点零七倍，但实际上呢，这个主要是受疫情的影响。那么二零一九年的这个数字要更高一些，那么它增长了只有百分之七吧。那么在这个呃森林、湿地、嗯、呃、农田。嗯，这几大类的这个生态系统当中呢，湿地，嗯，是 GEP 的重要组成，它占比呢是最高。那么其次呢是森林生态系统，嗯，然后呢是这个草地生态系统，嗯，那么从三个来看呢，年均增长率都还是比较快啊。那么，嗯，森林、湿地和农田呢，分别这个年均是增长百分之四点五、二点七和呃十三点六，这个呢是全国的一个 GEP 的核算结果。那下一页。那么围绕我们这个今天讨论的这个主题，就是流域，呃，这个核算呢，我们也是把这个全国的核算，嗯、呃，从中呢提取了这个、呃、黄河流域和长江流域来做一个比较。那么黄河流域呢，它一共是三百六十五个呃县，面积呢大概是一百零五点六万平方公里。长江流域呢，呃，面积更大啊，那么是八百。五十九个县面积占到了全呃一百九十三点三万平方公里，两个流域呢总和是占全国土地国土面积的百分之三十一。那么这两个流域呢，它的这个气候呢是不同类型的，因此呢，这个也决定了它的这个生态系统类型的呃是各有特点的。呃，那么黄河流域呢是以草呃草地为主，而长江流域呢是以森林为主。那么从 GDP 来看。嗯，二零一五年和二零一八年呢，这两个流域的 GDP 总量呢，嗯，分别大概占到了这个全国 GDP 的百分之八和百分之三十二。也就是说呢，长江流域它的经济发展水平呢，是明显高于这个黄河流域的，就是黄黄河流域呢，只占到了全国的百分之八啊，长江流域呢，呃，经济活动非常的活跃，呃，占到了百分之三十二。嗯，下一页。嗯，我们刚才提到，就是黄河流域呢，它是以草地生态系统啊、呃、为主要的生态系统类型，占到了百分之四十五。森林呢，嗯、呃，大概只占到百分之十二。而长江流域呢，它的森林生态系统呢，啊、呃，占比最高。嗯、呃，农田和森林这两类生态系统类型，分别是黄河流域的呃两倍和六倍。嗯、呃，那么这两个流域呢，在这个嗯、呃、过去的几年当中呢，我们说有喜有忧。嗯、呃，那么忧的呢是。这两个流域呢，都出现了这个城镇范围的明显扩张，也就是这个生态啊、呃、面积呢有缩小。那么主要呢是呃发展为城镇，就是建设用地，那么占用了周边的这个农田。嗯、呃，但是呢，从这个质量来说呢，由于这几年这个呃气候变化的影响，那么黄河流域呢西部的大量的荒漠呢是向草地来转化，嗯、呃，总体呢趋好生呃生态状况，而长江流域呢呃中西部呢也出现了草地向森林转化，那么其他类型的这个空间变化呢啊、呃、不是很明显，嗯、呃，下一页。那么从 GEP 总值来看呢，黄河和长江流域呢，它的 GEP 总值呢分别是 8.4 呃八点四万亿元和 25.5 万亿元。哎，我这儿好像看不到这个屏幕了。嗯，好。那么其中呢，这个调节服务啊、呃、是这个价值量是最高的。那么，在二零一八年呢，这个黄河、长江流域的调节服务呢，都分别占到了百分之将近七十和百分之六十。嗯，那么从这呃两年的这个趋势来看呢，它都呈呈现了一个增长的趋势。因为我们刚才提到啊，这个一个是草地面积在扩大
。另外呢是呃草地呢出现了向森林转化，那么森林因为它的单位面积 GDP 呢更高啊。那么从空间上来看呢，呃这两个流域都呈现出来一个西部高啊，就是我们看这个图呃不论是总的 GDP 还是这个呃调节呃服务和供给以及文化服务呢都是，呃就是特别是调节服务，它总体上都呈现一个西部高，就是我们说青藏高原是我们国家重要的这个水源地啊，生态服务功能区。所以它呈现了西部高，呃，东部次之，中部低这样的一个特征。那么在空间上的这个文化供给服务呢，和调节服务呢，呈现出了一定的这个互补性。好，下一页。嗯、呃，那么为了比较这个就是 GDP 和这个嗯、呃、GDP， 那么我们嗯、呃、提出来一个指数，叫做这个绿金指数，就是把这个嗯。呃嗯 ，GDP 和 GDP 之间的这个比值呢，来叫做这个绿金指数，来衡量的一个区域的生态环境和经济发展啊、呃、之间的一个平衡度的这样的一个指标。那么我们说呢，现在我们提提出呢，要实现双增长，就是经济总量呢和生态总量呢都要增长。那么我们看从黄河流域来看呢，它的这个 GDI 呃指数呢是大于一的，就是说明呢这个就是它绿水青山呢，嗯。生态环境质量的这个改善程度呢，要高于经济发展，就是说明呢，这个绿水青山它这个比金山银山的更高。那但是同样的也说明了，就是它这个呃金呃绿水青山就生态呃效呃效益还没有完全转化成为这种经济发展的动能。那么从长江流域来看呢？它的 GDI 指数呢是小于一的啊，就是绿金指数小于一，那么就说明呢，这个经济发展呢，呃，要好于这个生态的那个改善，那么也在一定程度上啊，可能呃反映出来，也许这个经济发展呢，可能对生态安全呢有一定的这个潜在的威胁啊。当然，我们这儿说呢，我们不是一个绝对的衡量，而是一个相对的衡量。好，下一页。下面呢，我给大家介绍几个，就是三个吧，这个呃自然资本核算的一个实际应用案例。那么第一个应用案例呢是在福建省，那么我们嗯、呃、帮助福建省呢构建了它的这个嗯、呃、双这个两个这个核算啊、呃，一个是 GEP 的核算，一个是 GEEP 的核算，嗯、呃、完成了这个七个试点省的呃七个试点市的。这样的一个呃核算，那么嗯、呃、协助他嗯、呃、出台的全国第一份就陆海统筹的自然资本。资本核算的技术指南，那么在中国呢叫生态产品啊价值核算那个指南，那是第一次呢把陆地生态系统和海洋同生态系统的同时考虑啊的这样的一份这个指南，这在全国呢也是第一份。那么在这个基础上呢，我们嗯、呃、共同的推进他们这个生态产品价值实现的工作。那么首先呢，他们提出来这个森林银行这样的一个概念，那么他呢就是把这些分散的土地呢集中起来呃管理，让它呢呃产生更大的这个生态效益。嗯，就是推动了生态产品价值的实现。另外呢，它通过这个推广武夷山水这个区域的品牌，那么来嗯提升它的一个溢价的功能啊，就是农产品的溢价功能。另外呢，它提出了这种林权改革啊、一言碳汇，来呃推进这个生态资源权益的一个交易。那么此外呢，呃，福建省呢，它建立了一个九龙江和呃这个汀江和涵江，就是上下。有流域的一个横向啊生态补偿协协议，这个呢在全国呢已经上升为一个啊、呃、全国的这样的一个典范啊，在这个呃生态流域补偿方面。那么此外呢，他还支持这个绿色金融，就是为一些这个绿色产业的发展呢提供的一个低息的贷款，这都是他在生态产品价值实现方面呢做的一些有益的探索。那么呃第二个呃。下一页，那么第二个这个案例呢，就是在西藏。那么我们呃协助呢西藏完成了这个全区的呃 GEP 的这个核算。那么根据这个核算呢，呃，就是纳曲地区和这个林芝地区呢，它的这个啊、呃、生态产品价值是最高的。嗯，那么同时呢，我们也发现呢，这个对于呃西藏呢，它的啊生态补偿可能还呃没有呃完全这个达到我们一个理想的状态。当然呢，我们说 GEP 核算的结果呢，不能够。啊，直接应用于来制定这个生态补偿的标准啊，呃，那么要综合一些其他的因素，呃，因此呢，我们对于这个完善西藏的这个呃生态重点生态功能区的这个生态补偿标准呢，基于 GEP 核算，结合它本身原有的啊、呃、这个呃标准，那么以及考虑到区域的特点，那么我们呃分别提出了这个完善。呃，国家重点生态功能区、自治区重点生态功能区和农产品主产区的这样一个呃补偿的标准，分别针对森林、草地和这个湿地。那么另外呢，也推动了它的这个生态产基于生态产品价值
呃核算的一个考核机制的呃建立啊，提出了这个自治区的一个绿色发展考核目标。嗯，这是第二个案例。那么第三个案例，下一页，呃，是在呃目前呢正在山西，也是在处于黄河中游呃这个省的呃那么一个尝试性的工作。这个呢还没有完全这个呃实现啊，但是呢呃正在呃这是应该是在路上啊 ，in progress 的这样的一个项目。那么我们提出了一个基于这个生态产品价值核算和绿色 GDP 考核，就是基于这个基呃。GDP 和绿色 GDP 和这个啊 GEP 双考核的这样一个考核体系，就是啊，它不仅是 GDP 啊，那么它是做绿色 GDP 和 GEP 的一个双考双考核的体系。嗯，那么我们提出了这个二级指标呢，就包括绿色经济、资源消耗，嗯，以及呢这个环境质量、生态保护，以及呢从绿水青山转化效率和这个生态呃经济结构完整性。一个结构稳定性六个方面提出这个二级指标，来对呃十一个呃市地市呢来提出了它的一个考核。那么这个呢是呃山西省呢是很有这个决心要推进啊这个基于双考核的这样的一个考核体系。那么这个呢实际上比这个就是 GDP 和 GEP 考核呢更近了一步啊。嗯，那么下一页，那么下面呢就是关于这个自然资本核算。嗯的一个总体的工作建议，下一页。那么我们提出呢四个方面的建议，首先呢是要加快建立生态产品，嗯调查监测机制，嗯来夯实呢这个核算的基础啊，这个是我们整个这个呃整个要开展这个精准化、精确化、定量化的核算的一个最基础性的工作。那么第二个方面呢就是推动这个生态产品价值核算的这个规范的一个制定，那么包括呢这个。呃，核算参数的地方化啊，这个也是非常重要的内容，以及呢，呃，生态产品那个数据的一个生产化的标准，就是呃，它的一个产生的那个标准啊，这个呢都要做出一个统一的规范，这样的才好指导这种全国的呃考核啊、呃，就是在同一标准下的考核体系的一个建立。嗯、呃，那么第三个建议，下一页。那么就是呢，开展基于生态产品价，就是自然资本核算的一个绿色金融，呃，政策的一个设计啊。那么落实呢，呃，两半啊，关于深化生态保护补偿制度，呃，改革意见等等啊，这样的一些这个呃具体的措施，呃，来促进呢，呃，生态产品价值的实现。那么第四个方面呢，我们认为呢，应该推动这个自然资本核算呢，进决策啊，进那个规划，进考核。呃，进交易，呃，时间关系呢，我就不详细这个论述这几条建议了。呃，那么以上呢，就是呃，我今天跟大家这个分享的内容。嗯、呃，谢谢。Thank you very much,、uh, Professor Yu, and a very interesting presentation and application of GEP、um, in the Yellow、uh, and the Yangtze River Basin. So our second speaker is、uh, Miss Cindy Zhang. Uh, she's the head of、uh, property treaty underwriting at Swiss Re in Beijing.、Um, she has worked in、uh, Hong Kong, Seoul,、uh, Sydney, Singapore, and、uh, Zurich in different capacities. And she's been heavily involved in the calibration work of the China earthquake, flood, and typhoon models.、Um, and since 2012,、uh, she's worked on regional government's natural catastrophe schemes programs.、Um, she talked about、uh, insurance to help government with disaster relief, with the case study from the、uh, Pearl Delta River. And、uh, thank you, Cindy.、Uh, just to、um, remind you that、uh, we are running a little bit、uh, over time, so、uh, if you could keep your presentation. And concise, please. Thank you, and、uh, over to you.、Uh, thank you, Celia. And、um, so, this is my honor to be invited to the ADB Knowledge Symposium. And、uh, this is Cindy from from Swiss Re.、Uh, so today, I would like to share with you how can we use insurance to cope with、uh, climate change with a case study in Pearl Delta area. So, move to the next slide. So、uh, this case actually is、uh, in Guangdong province. So maybe to these who are not very familiar with uh, this uh, this province, I just give a very short introduction. So Guangdong province is one of the most、uh, prosperous province in China, located in Pearl Delta area. 
it is heavily exposed to, to typhoon and, um, and heavy rainfall. As you can see from the two graphs below, which is captured uh, from 3-3's own has a map cat net. Uh, it uh, shows the, the exposure of typhoon as in the uh, in the left graph and also the flood exposure in the right graph. So in average, two to three typhoon make landfall in Guangdong every year, uh, brings strong wind and, uh, and heavy rainfall. So if we move to the next slide, uh, in the past, uh, Guangdong has been suffering from very huge economic loss from various catastrophic events. Just take example of the 2014, there is a super typhoon Ramazan uh, made landfall in Guangdong and affecting uh, three cities. So it caused a 1.23 billion RMB economic loss, which is equivalent to 200 million uh, US dollar. Uh, 99,000 residents were evacuated under the emergency. Next one. So there is a dilemma uh, uh, faced by the local government. Uh, it's a fixed disaster re re uh, relief budget versus uh, the randomness of the, of the events. Uh, for Guangdong government, they are responsible to mobilize resource for uh, disaster re re relief uh, post loss. But at the beginning, so after, at the beginning of each year, a fixed budget will be allocated uh, for the disaster relief. However, there is huge uncertainty on when the catastrophe will happen and how severe it is. So the, de the Department of Finance in Guangdong needs a financial mechanism so that they can enlarge the accessible capital for the disaster relief when mostly needed. So below is a very uh, simple illustration. So the blue, the blue bar shows the fixed budget that the government has every year to deploy, while the red part is the spending that it will, will need, depends on you know, how severe the catastrophe is for that year. The next page, please. Uh, so what insurance can help with uh, the local government to handle this dilemma is that uh, we have designed an insurance product for the local government. So in this is, it happens to 2015, that's three, three designed uh, insurance product for the Guangdong government. Uh, so each year, the government only need to spend a fixed budget to purchase this NAPCAT insurance. And whenever there's a heavy typhoon or rainfall, the scheme will pay a lump sum payment to the government for disaster relief. So the, the amount can be five to 10 times of the annual premium that the government spends every year. So unlike the conventional property insurance in which the payment amount after the loss is decided after the loss adjustment. So you, you have someone to come to your site and to calculate you know, exactly how much your loss is. So 3-3 helps the government to design a parametric NACAD insurance, which is quite different from the conventional indemnity-based insurance. It means the payment is only based on the intensity of the event itself. So if you can show, you can, you can basically save a lot of time and the resource to do loss adjusted. So exactly how, what kind of uh, parametric do we use? So for typhoon, it is based on the wind speed. So the stronger the typhoon depends on the grid, the higher the government will pay in terms of the loss amount. And for the rainfall, it is based on the local precipitation. So the, the heavier the rainfall, the, the higher the payment. And then for the earthquake, it is based on the magnitude. Next one. So since the establishment of this insurance in 2015, the Guangdong government scheme has provided over 1 billion RMB payment to the to local government. So below are just a few examples of you know, the events and also the payment for that specific event to the government. So it helps the government to enlarge its uh, accessible capital pool and to deploy more resources where mostly needed. The next one. So this is actually my, my last page. So uh, before I talk about you know, how the parametric insurance can help with the climate, can help the local government to cope with uh, climate change, but I still want to mention that you know, when it comes to, 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 to cope climate change and the net cash threats, the investment on infrastructure should come first. And it is actually the more 
cost-effective way. But uh, you know, once the investment goes higher and higher, uh, the marginal benefit will get lower and lower. And at one point, it becomes less cost-effective. So this is the area that the insurance should come in and uh, to, to, to help with the risk transfer for the residual risk. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Cindy, for your interesting presentation how to incorporate uh, parametric insurance for disaster risk management. Um, with Cindy's presentation, we actually conclude uh, session three on green financing instruments, and um, we actually move to the next session uh, with a geographic shift uh, from the PRC to other countries in the Asia Pacific. And we do have a rich uh, uh, panel uh, for discussions, and uh, um, uh, we have ADB colleagues. Uh, um, uh, talking about uh, how they have shaped and helped shape uh, river basin initiatives in the region. Um, the panel sessions moderator um, is again uh, my director, Tom Panella. Tom, the uh, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Sylvia. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, quite excited for this next session. Um, so we'll have presenters from the different regional departments in ADB, and we'll start uh, first uh, with Nathan Rive, who's a senior climate change specialist, as well as um, Ganjina Fazalova, uh, who is associate project officer um, from uh, Tajikistan Resident Mission, uh, representing Central West Asia Department. Um, please go ahead with your presentations. Thank you. Thanks, Tom, and uh, thank you, colleagues, uh, for the invitation to present very briefly. Um, so, uh, as mentioned, my name is Nathan Rib, Senior Climate Change Specialist uh, in the Central and West Asia Region Department, currently based in Manila. And uh, Gandina, if you'd like to introduce yourself uh, as well, you can put your um, video on. Thanks, Nathan. Hello, colleagues. I'm Ganjina Fazilova. I am Associate Project Officer based in Tajikistan Resident Mission. Thank you. Thanks. And just next slide, please. So um, just very briefly to give some two uh, very brief case studies. Uh, in this case, um, this is uh, a small case study on the Ravi River Basin Eco Revitalization Master Plan that was prepared uh, under an earlier technical assistance uh, to develop a sort of framework for uh, engagement in, in, the, uh, in the basin, as well as providing a framework for a, a rather an investment plan for, uh, for support in the, in the basin. So some of you may know that the Ravi River Basin is one of six transboundary uh, rivers comprising this uh, river system. Um, about 50 million people live in the basin uh, with around 10 million living in Lahore, which is the, the largest city in the basin. basin. Um, the uh, river basin actually comprises around 30% of uh, Pakistan's agricultural cultivation in, in Punjab. And um, it includes not only um, that agriculture, but, but some large industrial centers, so Lahore, Faisalabad, uh, Gujranwala, which puts uh, all together puts quite a bit of pressure on the uh, on the basin, uh, basin environment. Um, <coughs> significant built uh, structures uh, on on the on the river, uh, and the uh, river faces some significant pressure from disposable disposal of untreated sewage, uh, solid waste. Uh, livestock pressure, uh, non, uh, my sound is apparently muffled, uh, apologies. Let's see if I can change microphones. Is that a little bit better? Um, I'll try this. Uh, so um, the, where was I? And uh, yeah, so just, just uh, more broadly, um, uh, the next, the, the government of Punjab requested ADB support to develop this master plan with the aim of a long-term engagement uh, by, by ADB and other development partners. Next slide, please. So the starting point of this master plan was a uh, stakeholder engagement and envisioning um, exercise, which uh, comprised both um, both uh, both governments, uh, civil society, and academic. The stakeholders over a series of meetings um, and, and field studies uh, and with a, with a, a concluding vision of, of the, the basin of being a tapestry of diverse and healthy river environments that nurture and support well-being. The basin uh, master plan development sought to, to break it up into sort of four key areas, 
uh, of intervention and study, uh, the upstream of Lahore area, downstream uh, area, as well as the small and large sturdy millers in the uh, in the key urban areas, which are drains, uh, which in, in many cases have become open sewers. Next slide, please. So the master plan is um, uh, a longer term vision over uh, phased over 30 years, with the first phase uh, being around five to 10 years. And under that technical assistance, ADB supported the pre-feasibility study of around eight, uh, eight uh, priority intervention investments comprising around a billion, uh, a billion dollars. Uh, and uh, the intent was that ADB and other development partners would support the first phase of implementation of that master plan through the project. Next slide, please. Broadly speaking, and this is just the last one on the master plan, <clears throat> the strategy was to look at some key areas around uh, resettlement and, and acquisition of necessary land, uh, wastewater treatment, uh, inter, uh, programs for integrated urban water management, promotion of water steward, stewardship, uh, promotion of sustainable and agricultural practices to address some of these non-point non uh, uh, non source solution sources, uh, and uh, comprehensive baseline institutional strengthening and awareness program. Up there and please. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. Uh, th this is illustration of river basins in Tajikistan. Uh, the Panj River Basin, among five river basins, is the largest in Tajikistan. For your reference, it is as big as the Holland. The basin is the backbone of the country's agriculture sector. It covers the majority of the Khatlon province, which has the biggest population, around 3 million, and the most extensive agriculture production in Tajikistan. However, it is the country's poorest river basin and includes the most food insecure zone. The Panj River forms the boundary of Tajikistan and Afghanistan, where serious flood disasters frequently occur. ADB is active in the basin since 2011 and lead, is the leading agency among other DPs. Currently, we have been implementing water resource management in Panj River Basin project. Total amount of the current project is uh, 55 million US dollars, and these are mixed loan and grant funds. And this is also supported by the TA from uh, Japan Fund for Poverty and Reduction. Next slide, please. Well, the objective of the project is uh, to improve water resources management to boost agriculture production and improve food security and reduce poverty in the basin. At overall basin level, the project supports the country's ongoing water sector reform. At water supply level, the project aims at fully operationalizing major water resource management infrastructure with modernization and climate proofing. And at water user level, the project aims to improve capacity of water users associations. And there are, I, I just want to mention that there are three executing agencies on the pro, of the project. This is these are Ministry of Energy and Water Resources, uh, which is executing agency for output one, and uh, agency for land reclamation and uh, irrigation, uh, for output uh, two, two and three, and the, there is additional financing and which supports additional activities on the output one and three, and the executing agency is uh, Agency of Hydrometeorology or Hydromet. So next slide, please. Um, I would like to highlight key achievements on the output one of the project. First one is uh, the river basin organization was established. And given the size of the basin, two river basin organization working groups created, one in Kuliab and one in Horok. Specialists were, or for, the, uh, for the working group were selected, two offices uh, were constructed and equipped, uh, fully equipped. And starting from June 2020, the newly established organization is financed by the state budget, which is also a good achievement. And the second is creation of uh, uh, Panj River Basin Council. This was created in December last year. The Panj River Basin Council um, plays a very important advisory role in basin planning. 
It, it also participates in the decision-making process on water resources management and promotes the interests of all water users and stakeholders. So the council comprises representatives of the government, public organizations, and the civil society involved in water resources management in the basin. So the other thing, the major part of the work was development of the Pyanj River Basin Management Plan, which reflects Tajikistan's na national development policies and methodology developed and prescribed by the Ministry of Energy and Water Resources for all the river basin plans in the country. Major water issues uh, in the basin were identified through consultations with the Ministry of uh, Energy and Water Resources, local administrations, and other stakeholders. And the final uh, plan was endorsed by the uh, River Basin uh, Council during its first meeting, uh, December last year. And the next achievement uh, is development of database of on Pange River Basin. The main tasks included undertaking an inventory of main water intake and disposal points of surface and ground sources in the basin, applying GIS technology, preparation of maps and atlases, establishment of the database, preparation of guidelines for the use of the database, and comprehensive training for RBO staff on the use and update of the database. Now I give the floor back to Nathan, who will speak about common challenges in the sector. Thank you. And just very briefly, um, hopefully my microphone's a little bit better now. Um, so just uh, briefly, and just some of the common challenges experienced in Tajikistan and, and, and in uh, the Ravi Basin, Pianjin Ravi Basins, uh, that, that the uh, projects have identified fragmented uh, institutions, poor quality infrastructure, uh, lack of data, lack of implementation uh, and enforcement of existing policies low capacity for planning and low, uh, lack of experience in new technologies and and then of course the high vulnerability to the impacts of climate change uh, so all this put together uh, shapes in many ways the the uh, tas and, and projects that we we're putting together um, uh, to address some of these issues so i'll stop there thank you thank you very much uh nathan and gajina for uh interesting case and uh also for me, since I worked in Pyanj a long time ago in Afghanistan, uh, very nice to see the progression there. Um, next will be uh, uh, Rutero Takaku, who is a principal uh, water resource specialist um, presenting on IWRM in Cambodia for the Southeast Asia Department. Uh, Taka, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, so my name is Patrick Kuh, uh, Water Resources Specialist working in the Southeast Asia, South Asia Department in IDB. So this session, I'd like to talk about what uh, ADB is uh, designing of the IWRM project with the government of Cambodia. Uh, let me brief about IWRM overview in Cambodia first. So despite of the relatively higher water resources, Actual water use in Cambodia is the lowest among Mekong River Basin countries. About 90% of the rainfall occurs in the wet season. However, there are only 100 millimeter rainfall in torn up river basin group during the dry season. The Cambodia is one of the world's most full flat exposed countries with estimated annual 4 million affected people uh, annually. About 250 uh, million US dollar losses, uh, which is just over 1% of the uh, GDP of Cambodia. So more floods in wet season and more droughts in a dry season are projected, particularly in Thomas of the Basin Group. About 10% of the GDP could be lost by 2050 without adaptation to climate change. Tonus of fisheries account for 60% of the total protein intake for the Cambodian people. So improper river management and design of water infra infrastructure have been deteriorating rich eco-hydrology in Tonus of river basin group. Next slide, please. So even in the less recent five years, droughts and floods have damaged in the livelihood in Tonus of uh, river basin region. The graph on the left side shows the areas affected by 2019 droughts 
The graph in the right side shows the flooded area in 2020 flood. The tonus of region is both drought and flood prone regions, and frequency and seriousness are projected to increase due to the climate change. Next slide, please. Uh, to address those uh, flat and uh, uh, drought issues in Cambodia, particularly in terms of river basin group, the Cambodia, uh, Cambodian government uh, uh, had tremendous efforts so far uh, to address those issues uh, by constructing uh, dams, reservoirs, irrigation schemes, water supply system for domestic use. As you can see uh, some pictures uh, on this slide. However, uh, still, uh, as we can see in the previous slide, uh, like um, almost every year, uh, flood and drought happens, particularly in drone sub uh, regions. Uh, mainly because uh, one of the reasons is the weak water resource management planning and coordination capacities at all the level of the uh, all, at all the level of the country, including central government and regional governments. So this again resulted in a freak, uh, uh, unreserved issue uh, for continuous drought with low water productivity and continued flood and degraded eco hydrology, and particularly in tone subdivisions. So please go to the uh, next slide. So uh, to address this issue, uh, the government of Cambodia requested ADP uh, to design the uh, water resource management project. The project uh, that we are currently um, preparing um, is uh, based on the following principle. First, the project should be based on IWRM approach at the river basin level uh, for the better coordination and planning capacity uh, for central and regional government. Second, the project should be adaptive to climate change. And then third, the projects should be friendly to fish and eco hydrology. And then next, the project should maximize the benefits from existing and the proposed water resource management system and infrastructure. So these aspects are reflected in the design of the project. As you can see on this slide, uh, we are proposing three outputs. First output is at the core of the project uh, in Dimis IWRM approach including uh, some key activities planned, such as the establishment and operation of river basin committees and support regional government to prepare river basin management plans and to develop multiple reservoirs integrated operation plans to maximize the benefits of already existed uh, water resource uh, management reservoirs and dams and river flow management plans are uh, also to be uh, established and the uh, output number one. So output two is to address climate-induced drought during the dry season. Uh, in this uh, activities, uh, I'd like to pay attention to uh, the installation of the fish passages uh, is included uh, in output number two uh, to ensure that river basin uh, will be uh, fish and uh, eco-hydrology friendly. Output number three is to address flood risk so this flood risk uh, can be addressed by uh, several measures, such as non-physical measures uh, like uh, uh, flood risk mapping and flood preparation and flood focusing, and physical measures such as uh, dike strengthening of the dike or community levees uh, to uh, protect the communities from the flood. So we try to test nature-based solutions under Article 3. So next slide, please. So this is the last slide of my presentation. The key consideration to be given for further preparation of the project and to be uh, considered even during the implementation uh, is the sustainability of the IW, IWRM and the role of central government, provincial government, and community-based water resource management uh, institute. So key to, we are thinking that the key to success to the project is to ensure cross coordination with thy ministries, such as Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Water Resources, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of uh, Hydrology, etc., plus local governments and the community-based water resource management institute. 
and how to ensure the sustainable operation and management of the river basin committees, who will be responsible for establishing and implementation of the river basin management plan. So we are still at the early stage of the project uh, preparation. Um, so I hope that uh, this project will be uh, realized uh, uh, as early as possible this year. That's all from my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to Takaku for that um, good overview of uh, how you're taking this forward um, in Cambodia for IWRM at the, at the project level. Um, Next uh, is Lance Gore, who's a principal water resources specialist representing our South Asia department, who will be uh, talking about uh, India, the Karnataka, and Odisha, and uh, Nepal, the upper Bagmati River Basin. Lance, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, good evening, everyone, from where I am. Um, it's a pleasure to be here participating in this wonderful symposium. Um, I'm here to talk to you. I'm going to give you a general picture of, of some of the activities that ADB has been involved with in, in South Asia in terms of integrated water resources management. And I'll just be quickly showcasing uh, some examples from Bhutan, India, and Nepal. Uh, next slide, please. So ADB's involvement in South Asia has really started, I, th I think, around 2008, and we've been uh, actively participating since then. Um, our early experience was in India with Odisha starting around 2008 and uh, then moving on to Karnataka 2009, uh, Nepal, Upper Bagmati 2010 and then on to Bhutan in uh, about 2013. Um, all focused on how do we uh, introduce and mainstream IWRM practices within, within these locations. So, some of the challenges that face each of these locations are Bhutan, uh, one of the most water rich countries in the world per capita, um, but most of the water is inaccessible to the population. Uh, people, it's a very mountainous country, the bulk of the water flows deep in the valleys and people live up high on the sides of the mountains where they must rely on, on the local catchments. Um, has great uh, environment and that's something that the country wants to preserve and the large rivers are uh, being developed for hydropower and other economic uh, gains. In Karnataka and Odisha, there's a different type of problem where these are very large river basins, but they must sustain very large populations. Water scarcity is an issue uh, and uh, river basins are becoming closed for part or all of the year. There's strong competition for the water resources, but there's also strong competition for the uh, public uh, finances to uh, manage and operate the existing infrastructure that they have. And a lot of the infrastructure, infrastructure now is outdated and needs upgrading and replacement. Of course, water quality is also a, a key concern. And these, as I mentioned, these large Indian river basins really are uh, the, the food bowls for the country um, and must ma maintain food security. Irrigated crops consume 80% of the water resources in these basins. So focusing on how do we improve crop water productivity in the basins is a, is a key focus point. And the upper Bagmati River Basin, which is where Kathmandu is located, it's a very different challenge. Uh, it's, a, it's a very populated basin, uh, water scarce. Uh, the river is really the main artery and vein of, of the basin. Uh, almost no water flows in the, in the dry season. It's become very degraded. Uh, well, it be became very degraded and, and had severe water quality issues. And the, the Bagmati River has significant cultural uh, significance um, to the local people. Some common challenges really across all these locations are just the limited tools in terms of the policy and legislative, legislative frameworks, uh, the information they have, the hydromet, the spatial, uh, etc., and the status of their planning and coordination amongst the different agencies. Um, resources are limited. You know the staffing level, the, the the knowledge and the capacity of those staffing and the government funding. Um, and we're also in all these locations are dealing with entrenched bureaucracies. Um, they're very good at what they do, um, but there's not much coordination amongst them. Um, and they're very dynamic situations, dynamic in terms of climate change, changing environment, seasonality, population growth, economic growth, uh, and so forth. Next slide, please. 
So with some of the solutions that ADB has been uh, working with our, with our member countries with um, going dating back to 2008, we're, we're really what's shown on the page here. So strengthening policies and legislation, um, establishing and strengthening river basin organizations, water associations, water user associations, you know, gathering the information and organizing it and identifying where the gaps are and helping to address those gaps. Um, engaging with stakeholders and, and facilitating coordination amongst them, um, capacity development of all the stakeholders, um, exposure to international best practices and uh, state-of-the-art tools, uh, tools such as uh, new hydromet data systems, as shown in the in the picture on the on the left, uh, which is a, uh, using radar sensing for the flow, uh, measuring the flow in the canal, uh, remote sensing. Uh, GIS systems and so forth. I mean, uh, the water practitioners, these are these are common things, but uh, when you, some of the locations that we work in, these are all new new tools. You know, they have to be introduced to the, the local stakeholders and, and make them familiar with them. And uh, as I mentioned, we started uh, 2008, uh, it's a 15 year engagement and so forth. We're still engaged in, in most of these areas uh, through a series of, of different types of financing assistance from grants to loan, uh, et cetera. Next slide, please. Um, I, can, I can't say uh, generally in the long term it's been successful. We've had setbacks um, and we've certainly gained a lot of lessons along the way and we've iterated as we've moved from project to, to project and state or, or country to location. Um, so here's, here's a list of just my observations and some of the things that I think we've learned along the way, not just me, but also our stakeholders and governments as well, is really keeping it simple. Um, a lot of the times, there's a lot of pressure to jump straight to the, to, to the best product. Um, if we look at the spiral approach on the left, and by the way, you know, I like the spiral uh, diagram as something that was uh, common amongst the uh, water practitioners 10, 15, 20 years ago, but it's kind of faded away and I think it needs to come back because I, I think it really demonstrates the approach that needs to be taken. It has to be iterative, st uh, small steps and just uh, evolving on itself. So at the start, keeping it simple, um, just start with the information you have and the information could be the hydromet data, the spatial data, institutional uh, roles of, of the different agencies or the stakeholders that, are in the basin, where the, where the key problematic areas are, what the goal of the basin is, you know, what are you trying to achieve? Is it focused on food security? Is it uh, focused on improving water quality, preserving the environment, et cetera? There has to be a goal. Sometimes it could be a few goals, but having a goal happens to sharpen the people's focus and also helps to economize the resources you have. Because all these things, uh, all these programs cost money. Um, and it's, it's quite often in the countries that we're working in, it's money that's not freely available. It has to be taken from another priority, the government. So we have to demonstrate the value in terms of managing the river, river basin. So start simple, start with what you have, organizing, organize the existing information into a, something that's straightforward for lay people to understand. Water professionals, it's simple for us. We, we think we need to, to make it more complicated to showcase what it is. But the reality is most stakeholders don't have that appreciation. You know, keeping things simple is, is best for them. Um, nothing works better than putting a, a map down in front of people and getting people around a table to discuss. And, and they, they can feel like it's tangible. Uh, they, they can quickly start uh, talking about the issues they have and even some of the solutions they may have. Make it transparent. You need transparency to gather trust. And this is a long-term uh, program which requires trust. Um, develop a long-term roadmap and then work in incremental ways of trying to resolve that. Make sure that you define roles, responsibilities, and accountabilities. One of the issues I've come up against is you can say, hey, great, we're going to make an RBO. Um, you're going to be the chair of it. But when we actually take that to the, to the key person, to, to be the chair, they're going, well, hold on, I have all these other responsibilities. Now you're going to give me this one too. What's my accountability here? What happens if this doesn't go the way it should be? There are real concerns here and then they can be setbacks. So helping to define those and then embedding them in a, in a legislative framework helps. It takes time to, to, to form those um, 
policies and acts and, and, and regulations and so forth. So be, be impatient, invest in the time and resources. Um, bringing in outside help, knowledge sharing. Um, we've had some very good success where we take um, a group of stakeholders across to another part of the same state or country and demonstrate some of the things that we're trying to achieve. Uh, get, get the stakeholders to talk to each other. Um, bring in some external uh, global experts or, or regional experts, if that helps. Um, open people's minds to new ideas. As I said, demonstrate some uh, value. People respond, success breeds success. And then just continue to evolve, keep working on that roadmap, and I think things will improve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lance, and uh, appreciate that last slide with some very... Um tangible and concrete uh, recommendations and uh, simple simple recommendations at that. Anyway, thank you. Um, so let's move on to our last uh, uh, presentation. Um, and I'm pleased to present uh, Francesco Riccardi, uh, who is with the uh, Senior Environment Specialist with our Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department, but he'll be um, presenting on behalf of the Pacific uh, Department with the Aloha Multipurpose Dam Project. Uh, Francesco, please go ahead, thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, and thank you everyone to be here until the very end of the symposium. Um, so yes, as uh, Tom said, I'm presenting a, uh, actually a Pacific Department uh, plan project that has benefit from many inputs also from, from SDCC in various topics. So. The project itself is a multi-purpose dam uh, in the island of Samoa, in the country of Samoa, uh, which is a, actually a multi-use facility. So it's not um, the main objective in this case will be flood protection, uh, but we'll also have some components related to water storage and some um, energy production as well. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the project has, of course, encountering uh, several challenges like many of these big dams is, uh, are facing. Uh, the, the very first one is, is a global one, it's not only related to Samoa, and it is the um, freshwater biodiversity decline, decline and the, the corresponding ecosystem services. So we know that almost one third of uh, world's freshwater biodiversity is actually facing extinction at a higher rate compared to terrestrial biodiversity. Uh, these threats are normally are often due to uh, a habitat loss, fragmentation due to dams or other infrastructure, introduction of uh, invasive alien species, pollution, and also over harvesting of water. So uh, this problem is probably expected to worsen as the um, human population grows. So how we can ensure to obtain the expected results of such a large infrastructure, and at the same time try to protect this very high and unique biodiversity present in the country. So for example, we have identified that project possibly can impact critical and natural habitat of both terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems with potential, if not mitigated, irreversible negative impact on endangered species, including some uh, migratory species and endemic uh, freshwater species, but also some terrestrial animals like the national bird of Samoa, which is called Manumea. Uh, very few uh, specimens still exist. Next slide, please. So the very st first step that we had to do is considering alternative design in terms of also locations. We, we, we consider different location of the dam in, inside the catchment uh, to ensure that the impacts are avoided as much as possible. So for example, we decided to move uh, the power plant, uh, the power generation plant to the toe of the dam instead of uh, a few hundred meters away to reduce the habitat loss due to the watering after the dam itself. And the loss of energy was uh, compensated redesigning the, the, the power plant itself, so it was possible. Um, we also calculated and implemented um, an environmental flow, which was say, scientifically based on, on uh, internationally approved methods. So we, we tried to move away from the most commonly used, uh, even too, mu too much use, uh, fixed percentage of the minimum annual flow. And this uh, environmental flow it will include natural variation in the river flow, flow itself. You know, a river is not a 
uh, <clears throat> continuous flow at the same level every day, but it changes. And this fluctuation of, of, of flow can trigger also some uh, very important uh, biodiversity and ecology uh, in, in the river. <clears throat> uh, so avoidance of negative impact is the first uh, very important step we need to take, but we also include mitigation and compensation in this case, because avoidance was not enough. Uh, we include a, a, the preparation of a biodiversity management strategy, strategy include, including also an off-site compensation in terms of policy support and also direct actions to restore and protect other areas of the watershed with the support of local communities. Next one, please. Okay, also very last one. So the main recommendation in, in this case is to try to avoid potential negative impact um, and planning the development in a strategic way uh, and already at the river basin level, not thinking on the single project itself. Uh, we need to consider early stage assessment, which include environmental flows and also safeguard assessment. In, in most cases, you will be able to reach um, this, the, the target outcome and avoid uh, biodiversity impacts altogether. Or you can reconfigure or relocating water development infrastructure and try maybe to include some uh, nature-based nature -based solution, nature-positive solution, like watershed restoration for flood control or considering the use of alternative energies, like for example, using the flo floating solar in existing uh, reservoirs. So we have the science, we have the science that can provide the tool uh, that make uh, the best of the information and technology available. Uh, we then need to identify trade-offs to highlight op different options and facilitate a policy dis discussion that are really critically needed in, in a river basin around the world that are facing the same sustainable uh, development dilemmas. So we have this tool, we need to commit to use them and try to move away from the business as usual concept, not moving ecological and biodiversity consideration, at the same level of engineering and financial constraints. And um, I'm done with this. Thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. Thank you very much, Francesco. Um, great presentation. Uh, interesting project and one you wouldn't necessarily uh, think of in uh, Samoa. Um, so uh, let me just make a few closing remarks. I know we have some questions, so I would encourage those um, panelists who've been addressed with questions to, to type answers. Um, I'll just make a few remarks, and for those who want to stay for the Q&A, um, we can do it because we're, we're running up against time. But uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, everyone who came today and for the excellent contributions to the Knowledge Symposium. Um, I think we had uh, enough material to fill a full day, um, but uh, the presentations were all very interesting and insightful. As we see, major rivers are the arteries that support uh, regional socioeconomic development, human health and well-being, and biodiversity and ecosystem services. And the growing awareness about the importance of integrated approaches to river basin management uh, was well captured in all the presentations today. I'd like to highlight. Uh, three lessons and some takeaways from today's symposium. First, as I think we know, approaching river basins as a single ecological and socioeconomic unit highlights the importance of using landscape basin approach as the appropriate scale for integrated action. This is paramount to improve water security more holistically throughout a basin, as we learned um, from Director Sung Fang in the Yellow River Conservancy Commission. Second, coordinated regulatory frameworks and policy incentives are essential to improve planning and decision-making processes at basin scale. We've heard firsthand about the, uh, the, we've heard about the first wetland law in the PRC, as well as innovative policy approaches to address pollution control in the Yangtze River through the governance mechanisms such as the river chief system, as we learned from our colleagues at GWP, Client Earth and Nature Conservancy. Third is presented by the Chinese Academy of Environmental Planning, natural capital valuation and associated financing mechanisms have the potential to be an important approach to leverage public sector finance and advance greener development. Uh, 
In addition, Swiss Re showed how application of existing insurance concepts and tools can cope with climate related risk and provide options to local governments to deal with natural disaster. Uh, we also had the opportunity to look beyond the PRC and gain valuable lessons from ADB projects in our different regional departments. Um, my colleagues have highlighted uh, challenges and success stories from very diverse river basins. These span from successful experiences of master plan development in Pakistan, as well as uh, basin planning in Tajikistan, to project level solutions for integrated river basin management and policy reforms in Cambodia. Um, they also highlighted the importance uh, of institutional reforms and coordination uh, to achieve objectives in South Asia, as well as the importance of mainstreaming biodiversity, conservation, and environmental planning, as in the Pacific case. I think it's interesting also that uh, one of the, the key aspects of all of these stories was engaging stakeholders um, and bringing uh, more people into the process. In East Asia, our own YREC initiative is a good opportunity to advance our partnership with the PRC through integrated projects and policy dialogue, um, as well as through knowledge sharing events like the symposium to disseminate results. Uh, lastly, I'd like to thank the PRC Fund, whose generous support made this event possible, and to my colleagues uh, who helped putting this uh, event together and um, it was quite a bit of work and again, much appreciation. We hope to hold more events uh, in the future to strengthen ADB's network and realize our shared vision for greater regional cooperation and knowledge sharing among ADB members. Uh, thank you once again for participating and I look forward uh, to future collaboration and partnerships. Uh, thanks. And, and for those who do wanna stick around, um, let me see if uh, we can answer some of the questions. Um, and uh, the first one, I guess, would be from Eva uh, to Takaku. Um, Taka, can you respond to the question? You indicated you'd like to respond to it. Of embedding IWRM. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I think uh, uh, you are talking about the question provided by Mr. Fu Miduna regarding uh, how is a proposed environment of the local government and community in the uh, WR management, etc. So let me let me respond uh, to his questions. Um, so and the, uh, the Cambodia already established water resource management uh, law. Uh, and uh, related sub-degree, stipulating who will do what uh, to address uh, IWRM approach. So in line with this, ADB uh, will uh, help local government to establish river basin management committee and try to help them uh, to influence and uh, to develop and manage uh, river basin management plan. But I think uh, this may not be sufficient uh, for their efficient and effective implementation and management of river waste management committee and river waste management plan. So therefore, we are trying to um, uh, help not only local government, but central government, in this case, Ministry of Water Resource and Meteorology, uh, so that uh, they will provide necessary uh, technical, institutional uh, advice to the local government when they develop the river basin committee and when they uh, operate a uh, river basin uh, committee and management plan. Plus, uh, to ensure sustainability, uh, we need to push uh, to the Ministry of Economy and Finance uh, to get commitment from them uh, to uh, provide the necessary budget for operation and uh, uh, management of river basin management committee and plan. I think uh, uh, I could clarify your questions. Thank you. How about to you, uh, Tom? Yeah, thank you very much, Takaku. Um, and we had a few questions uh, to Yu Fang, and I'm just wondering if she, is she's still here and able to respond to those questions on GAP. Uh, 
I'm still here. Yes. Okay. Yes, please go ahead. If do you have the questions in front of you in the chat box? So I find one question from Eva. Is that a um, question? Yes. Yeah, that, that, that's fine. Please go ahead and, and respond. Thank you. Yes, I think that the carbon uh, sequest sequestration is one key component uh, of the GDP accounting. Uh, yes, so uh, so I think that the critical uh, uh, CP uh, could uh, play a critical role in carbon capture and uh, carbon offsets of opportunities. Yes, I, I think uh, the answer is yes. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, and there was another question that came in uh, for the last presentation uh, for Francesco, if you're still there, whether ADB used uh, the World Bank or International Hydropower Association uh, guidelines. Um, and I believe World Bank uses IFC, don't they? But uh, please, yeah. if you could talk about guidelines, go ahead. We, we use, thank you, Tom. We use, um, of course, uh, the ADB's uh, safeguard requirement mostly that, um, make reference to the best uh, the, the common the good, good international best practices so some of them of course we take from from the world bank there are some interesting guidelines on uh, on hydropower but was uh, i believe this apart of from 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 the the guidelines themselves every each country has a very specific need they need to be addressed on a country specific matter so a lot of consultations a lot of uh, field study to, to to investigate what what's real problem of of the country how can 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 we really assess that so i hope this answer the the question thank you thank you very much uh francesco and um i think that covers uh most of the the questions i see that are still remaining open um and for those that we did not respond to uh we will uh, try to get you um, answers by email. Um, are there any other questions that people would like to pose? Well, we, we do have uh, some of the panelists here. Uh, Tom, Takahiro. Yes. Uh, I think uh, there are uh, still one question. <laughs> uh, yeah, at the top effective there. Effective question uh, regarding, the, regarding biodiversity. Um, so the question uh, came from Mr. Uh, Eva about uh, that the project uh, uh, can uh, center biodiversity in the project design. So I'd like to respond to this question. Uh, biodiversity uh, seems uh, uh, too broad to be covered by our project, uh, but uh, we try to uh, address the existing problem, which is deteriorating of eco-hydrology uh, because of the poor uh, design of the uh, river crossing structure, such as waves uh, in the Tony Sap River Basin Group. Uh, by uh, installing uh, fish passage and fish ladder and others. So the project uh, objective of, of those installation is to is, uh, is for the smooth migration of fish and other aquatic animals. Uh, up, between upstream and downstream of those people crossing structure. So it will at least the help <laughs> the uh, fish and uh, healthier uh, eco hydrology uh, and our project. I hope I could uh, answer this question. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Takaku. And uh, with that, uh, I think we have. Uh, addressed most of the questions. Um, and uh, we will have the presentation materials available as well as a recording of the session. Um, and we can make those available to you um, in, a, in a few days. Um, 
And again, I'd like to thank everybody in the audience for their interest, as well as for the panelists uh, for their interesting presentations. Um, and uh, thank you. And uh, we will see you at the next symposium. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.